Welcome back everyone, this is Travis here with Fisher Hex. In today's video, I'm going to talk about 10 things that you can start implementing today that will not only save your reef tank, but it will save your house and your loved ones. So let's go and get started. Okay, number one, start using GFCI outlets or power strips. Now, if you're not sure what this stands for, it's Ground Fault Circuit Interrupter. Now, I will link an article in the description below that you can read more in depth and kind of get a better idea what I'm talking about. But to basically sum it up, it's an outlet or a power strip that monitors the flow from one side of the outlet to the other and if it, it basically monitors for any imbalances and if it detects one it will turn off the outlet immediately now they like to use these in bathrooms because a lot of people use the hair dryer near the sink so if they if it accidentally falls into the sink it will trick the outlet and not kill you or burn your house down so this is definitely a good thing you want to use near a reef tank especially when you have water all over the place and that potential of, uh, of it getting into the outlet so i definitely recommend you get a gfci outlet or power strip and if you are like building your house, uh, getting those outlets where you're going to have your reef tank already installed is definitely a good idea. But if you're like me and you live in an apartment, getting the power strip is definitely better than nothing. Okay, number two, start using drip loops on all your equipment, specifically those of you who are using a lot of hang on the back equipment, such as skimmers, your heaters are going into the tank, your power heads, all that kind of stuff. Now you want to make sure that you can uh, implement these drip loops so if the water was to flow down the cord it would get caught up in the drip loop and go on the floor opposed to it running all the way down to the outlet and potentially causing a fire or other damage to the equipment. Now I will link a picture so you know what I'm talking about and if you have any further questions feel free to ask or go ahead and hit the Google button. There's a lot of information out there on drip loops. All right, number three, mount all your power strips and controller power bars on a side of a wall or inside the tank stand. Now what you want to do is you want to keep it off the floor if you can. Uh, basically what I'm getting at is if water was to come out of the sump or if a piece of equipment would crack or break, it would uh, prevent the water from flowing into that power strip. Now if you're not using the GFCI outlet, there's a good chance that you'll fry the power strip, you'll fry the equipment attached to it, and there's also a high chance that you'll have a fire. That's all bad stuff, it's all expensive, and it's just not worth it. So go ahead and use the screws that come with your equipment or come with a power strip and just hang it up so you don't have to ever worry about water flowing into it. Okay, number four, this might not be in everybody's budget, but purchase an aquarium controller. This can cover you in so many different aspects. A few of them are uh, monitoring for water and leak issues, power interruptions, all that kind of stuff can be sent to you via text or email so you can get notifications when the power goes out or there's an issue at the house or the sump is about to overflow or something isn't working right. An aquarium controller is, I wouldn't say a must, and you, you definitely don't need one to be successful, but I will say when you start investing thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars into a reef tank and you get up to 10 grand or so, you start seeing that that six or $700 investment into an aquarium controller to protect all of that is definitely worth it. But if you're just starting out and you're really new to the hobby and you only have you know a couple hundred bucks invested, it wouldn't really be worth it to go spend another 700 on an aquarium controller for that small of a setup. But I will say as you progress, that is definitely going to be an option I would look into. Okay, number five, purchasing a generator or a battery backup for your system. Now, deciding between the two is definitely going to depend on the size of your tank and how long do you want to protect it for. I personally lean towards the generator side of things because it's much easier to go get fuel and just continue to fill it up and have it run for however long you need it to. Now, with a battery, it's eventually going to run out and there's only a limited amount of equipment that you can connect to it. Now, with that being said, I would say go with the generator. Get one that will at least power your main return pump and your heater. That way you can keep the temperature and also your chiller if needed, depending on where you live and how hot it is. But you want to be able to keep those, uh, I guess, the heart of your system alive. The reactors and that stuff can, you know, if you have to, you know, not have flow going to a reactor or whatever or, or some piece of equipment that isn't that vital, not running, it's not a big deal. You want to at least keep water flow going and heat and cooling to keep the reef tank stable. Now, I definitely recommend you get one when you can i know that they are expensive but a lot of people tend to wait until it's too late either when the power goes out or you know something has already happened and unfortunately most of the time people are in the same position you are they're running to the store to buy a generator and you know it might be out of stock and then what are you going to do sit there and watch your reef tank slowly die now i have personally seen this happen it's just not worth it and uh, it's heartbreaking to watch you know all the effort you put into that tank slowly die because you refuse to spend a couple hundred dollars on a generator earlier on. So keep that in mind and uh, uh, make the decision soon. Okay, number six, using high and low float sensor alarms to indicate the water level within your sump. Now, check valves, yes, everybody uses them when they build their system, but they do get dirty and they do fail. So if your power was to go out, the water would slowly continue to increase in the sump and could potentially overflow. If you add sensors that not only indicate the high level in the sump, but also if 
say your auto top off pump dies, you won't know. Your water will slowly keep going down. This will tell you that the water is too low within the sump, uh, indicating that you know one of the pumps have died or something's not working well. Now these are very easy to make and add to your system. You connect them to the breakout box via the Apex, program them to send email or text notifications. I highly recommend them and I will actually do a video here in a couple weeks. I'm gonna be adding a couple more to my sump because I've recently had some issues with my flow switch and um, I wanna make sure that I can get the notification before it happens again. So stay tuned for that video, but I definitely recommend you add these higher low flow sensors within your sump. Another thing that is really good is that for those of you who are using Calc Wasser in your auto top off, it's always good to be able to turn off the ATO pump if something was to get stuck on. Now what happens is, is if you don't have this switch to turn off the ATO pump, you're gonna to continue to drop in all this water that has calc in it and you could potentially send the pH and alkalinity through the roof in your reef tank depending on how big it is and you can potentially kill everything. So that's also a good reason to use these switches. Okay, number seven, having a backup pump just in case the main return pump was to fail one way or another. Now in my situation, I definitely learned the hard way and I do have a video somewhere on my channel talking about it, but basically to sum it up, I was using the old bio pellets and they were releasing this kind of film. And uh, consequently, when the power went off, the pump never turned back on. Luckily, I was home and I could catch it. Now, what I end up having to do is rip that main pump out and clean it as fast as possible and get it back into the tank. Now, unfortunately, the tank still went about 30 minutes without any power, but luckily enough, nothing died or there wasn't any issues from it. Still, right now, I have a pump sitting in the other room that is ready to go into the sump to pump water back up to the main display. It doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't have to connect to your original line. It simply can be a utility pump that has a hose attached to it from Home Depot. Just throw it in the sump and pump water outside the sump, outside the tank stand, and just clip it to the top of the tank and let it flow in. Uh, some flow is better than no flow, and I highly recommend you guys get an extra pump just in case. All right, the last three things I'm gonna talk about before I let you go are all what you can do to prevent issues from inside the reef tank. Now, the first one, of course, is quarantine all your fish. Now, if you've been on this channel for any period of time, you know I talk about quarantining pretty often, and I swear probably one-third of my videos are about quarantine. And, of course, I have a playlist that you can check out if you have any questions on that. Now, I continue to talk about it because I continue to get questions on a daily basis regarding parasites and ways to prevent them, yada, yada, yada. And the reality is if you quarantine your fish and you took the steps previously, you wouldn't have these questions. Now, what I mean is, Quarantine all your fish regardless of species and what you've read on the internet or whatever bullshit Joe Schmo at the local fish store told you. Quarantine all your fish for a minimum of four weeks and do preventative treatment for internal and external parasites. Now, say three and a half weeks in, you see something come up, you uh, treat for that issue and then start your quarantine process over. That's how it goes. Now, my hippo tank was in quarantine for almost 16 weeks. Now, she's been in this tank for almost a year. She's happy. She's fat. She's a little bit of a jerk but she's still alive and she wouldn't be if I decided to skip on any of those treatments. So basically what I'm saying is take the proper steps to protect your fish, your aquarium, and your investment. Now a lot of people have come up to me and said, hey, my local fish store uses copper or I get my fish from a reliable source. Honestly guys, that doesn't mean anything to me. There's always going to be an exception. So you need to start taking the proper steps to protect your reef tank now. If you haven't, please check out the playlist and just in case you don't know some of the ins and outs and how to treat certain things, check out that playlist that I have and uh, you know, start learning today and implement this now and you will have success in the future if you do so. Okay, number nine, dip and if possible, quarantine all your coral. Now, as for the dipping thing, everybody should be doing that. If you have the room and the resources, please set up another system to quarantine your coral. If you've been in a hobby for any period of time, you've probably experienced red, red bugs, flatworms, nudibranchs. The These are all things that can be pretty devastating to a main display tank, especially if it's full of coral already. And if you have a quarantine system, you can pick up on these things and treat them in a smaller tank environment and uh, prevent them from ever getting into the main display. So with that being said, I do understand if you can't make it happen, but try your best. A lot of people who have soft corals and just starting out tend to quarantine in like 10 gallon tanks with hanging on the back filters and stuff like that. Now that might not be good for some LPS and particularly SPS coral, but for softies, that's definitely a good way to catch those nudibranchs that tend to plague most zoanthid colonies. Either way, look into it and um, see how it works out for you. Okay, finally, number 10, monitor how much you feed your fish and how often you feed your coral. Now, if you have elevated nutrient levels or you have algae in your reef tank, you should definitely not be feeding your coral. People feed coral because they want to enhance coloration, growth, and polyp extension. You are defeating all those purposes by continuing to add to the problem via feeding. Now, on the other side of things, when it comes to fish, if they're not eating all the food within a five-minute period, either remove it with a net or cut back next time. I like to recommend having a set schedule for feeding with a set amount. As with coral, 
I like to feed every other week or once a month, just, you know, general uh, coral foods, nothing fancy. I think I, I use um, some Fido at some point, and then I like to use the BRS Reef Chili. That's about the extent of my feeding coral. And frankly, I don't even target feed anymore. I just put it in the power head, let it uh, kind of move around and uh, remove the filter sock for about an hour or two and then put it back on. So that's my extent of feeding. And as you can see, my tank grows just fine. So I'll leave that up for debate. I'm not going to get into that with anybody. But uh, that's about it for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it to be helpful. I hope you could take something from it and implement it into your life and make things better for you. Now, if you guys like the video, feel free to give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe for more. And I'll see you next time. Peace. <music>